Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you. And may I also offer a welcome from my fellow partners and colleagues from Mazar here, here, here in Romania. We're delighted to be working with the Bucharest Stock Exchange on, on this event. This morning, I'd hope to talk to you about corporate governance. The areas that I'd like to touch on, really three main, three main areas to talk about in the five. First of all, just to, in order to set corporate governance in context, to talk about corporate governance across the EU and some of the differences and similarities that exist. And then to go on to the new Bucharest Stock Exchange Code, and in, in talking to you about that, to try and set it in the context of some of the practices of which I'm aware, particularly from the London market, um, that might also be, be relevant. And then thirdly, to talk about some key areas uh, which you may want to look at going forward in terms of continuous improvement around reporting, around culture, and around board evaluations. Looking at some of the differences of corporate governance across the EU, and I think the real thing to highlight is that each of our corporate governance systems in our respective countries, each system is unique. It's based on our national cultures, our national laws, and how they've evolved over time. And that's one of the really you know, fascinating things of this topic. But some of the key differences that exist in different countries across the European Union on corporate governance. The first one there is, in some countries, in the UK we very much have unitary boards. In Germany it's very much two-tier boards. And in Romania I think you have a mixture of the two. So whether you've got one-tier boards, two-tier boards, or a mixture is one way of distinguishing between different corporate governance systems. I think each of the systems has its strengths and its challenges. The strengths, I think, of the unitary system is that the directors, executive and non-executive, work together. So it can enable the non-executive directors to get a really good understanding of the business. The challenge of our, that system is that it can challenge independence because if non-executive directors and executive directors work together, then you know some non-executives say over time, it can mean you get quite cozy um, and so the challenge can get you know, more difficult. On the other hand, the challenge of the two-tier board, the strength of it is there's definite independence, definite separation of management and the supervisory board. The challenge, I think, is it's harder for the supervisory board to get a really good understanding of what management is doing. So each of the systems has its strengths and weaknesses. The, another way to um, look at corporate governance is by reference to the capital markets. In some jurisdictions, and again speaking from the UK, we traditionally have had a very strong, and the President's comments earlier perhaps highlighted it, we particularly have a very strong capital markets approach. In historical terms, the capital markets would have played a bigger role in financing business than, say, banking. In other countries, the banks, and I think here in Romania, the banks would have played a significant part in financing businesses. So, again, whether you're financed by stock exchange or by um, banks will, will vary. Also, the, the amount of free float varies quite a lot between countries. In many countries, and I think the more predominant one in the European Union is that a number of the companies listed on the market often have one major stock, you know, one major shareholder. We don't tend to have that so much in the UK. We tend to have nobody owning a high proportion of shares. Where there's one major um, shareholder, whether it be this, could be the state, as sometimes in Romania and other countries, or could be a parent company or whoever, where there's one major company, then I think the related party transactions issue becomes of major interest to investors. Investors will always worry where there's a major shareholder, you know, are they being treated fairly if they're an outside in investor? And the last area to look at in looking at corporate governance codes is, corporate governance code is part of what companies have to do. It, there's also lots of things in legislation. And so what's in a code, what's in legislation varies between countries. So different approaches across the European Union. And, and I guess it's to learn, whilst respecting each culture is unique, to see what we can learn from each other is quite important. 
As part of that, at Mazar, with working with Ecuador, the Directors Association of Europe and the European Corporate Governance Institute, we undertook a major study on corporate governance across the European Union. And moving on to the next slide, I'll highlight some of the issues that um, we, we looked at. Some of the key differences, um, we covered all the, all the member states of the European Union and Norway as well. Um, luckily at the moment in saying all the member states of the European Union, I can include the United Kingdom. Um, that will of course not be the case, um, sadly, in some, some time in the future. But looking, looking at that, we covered all the states of the European Union and Norway. And I think some of the things that highlighted was some countries had adopted codes early. We started corporate governance in the UK in 1992 following a major crisis. And the corporate governance code in the UK was following a major, um, a major crisis of companies where a couple of major companies had failed and people were asking why, why was this allowed to happen. And we tend to have looked at our corporate governance code fairly regularly. And, and so have updated a number of times since. And then after sort of early countries, uh, Romania and a number of other countries are in that major group of countries that between 2001 and 2007 introduced a code, and then some other countries following, um, such as Greece in 2011. The corporate governance code, the structure varies, some codes more principles, some more, more rules, but basically, all the codes allow you to comply, or as the president said earlier, to explain in certain circumstances where compliance isn't possible at a particular time or isn't relevant. And just one point on comply or explain. In the UK, we do have a fairly strong view that actually there should be some explanations and not compliance all the time. If you're complying all the time, the risk is the companies are just implementing the code because it's easier to implement it fully rather than saying, is there something different about my company that means I should actually explain rather than comply? So it's getting that balance between you know, not, not failing to comply when you should comply, but equally having the courage to explain rather than comply when it's more relevant to do so. And looking at some of the conclusions of the ECODAR report, and I think if we can move on to the next slide. Yep. Um, the, I mean, some of the major conclusions that we came to in the ECODAR report were all, com all countries have adopted a self-regulatory approach, um, but the way in which it happens varies between countries. So. Different, different approaches to monitoring, but most countries have adopted some form of monitoring compliance with the code. And again, your president you know, spoke of some of the results of, of that compliance as they happened. I suppose the really interesting area, in a way, is some of the areas of non-compliance that occur most frequently across Europe. Transparency issues is one of them. And again, the amount of the willingness to disclose area issues around directors' remuneration and things does vary across countries. Some of this will be individual companies. Some of it will more be different approaches, perhaps within countries, where there's more worry on certain issues. Also, requirements for the functioning of the board, um, some of the non-disclosures relate to that. And again, interestingly, um, some around that related party transactions and conflicts of interest. So some of those areas relating to transparency, very important to investors, and some of the areas in which there doesn't appear to be, um, you know, where there's sometimes compliance rather than, um, where there's non-compliance at the moment. So interesting areas to, to look at. Moving on to, the, uh, to further conclusions, that in most, um, in most countries, over half of private and public bodies have been involved in the development of the code. So very much trying, the code is very much a means of business and the regulators working, working together to get best, best solutions. 
a variance in how it's done, some more principles-based, uh, some more rules-based, some a combination of the two. Um, but also on the monitoring side, um, the, the monitoring process checks the analysis of the content of disclosures in 15 countries. The availability of the disclosures um, in five countries was um, given. So in most countries, actually looking at how well companies disclose is what the monitoring does, not just do they disclose. Um, so I think interesting issue for regulators around different approaches to regulation there. I'd now like to move into the core part of the presentation, which really looks at some of the key areas of the Bucharest uh, Stock Exchange. And I think firstly to highlight, as on the next slide, um, the, that I think it's really excellent that the Bucharest Stock Exchange has stressed the aim of the code, the aim to build internationally capital, attractive capital market in Romania and to promote confidence in listed companies by promoting positive development in corporate governance. I think each of the, those first two, trying to promote an internationally attractive capital market in Romania is clearly a benefit to all existing companies on the market in terms of having a good fair market in their shares and attracting investors, and also to new companies listing, giving better chance to potential companies listing um, to get a listing at a good, good and fair price. And clearly also to the extent that it promotes confidence in individual companies, it allows those shares to be well traded at the right price. I think the other key note to welcome on the new code is its statement that the role of good governance is to promote good, effective entrepreneurial management that delivers long-term success. And I think two issues there. The promotion of long-term success is very important. There's some concern in the UK at the moment um, under the government of Prime Minister Theresa May that we do need to make sure the business is focusing on long-term success and also, and on a serious note, it's felt that one of the um, reasons for Brexit might be that not everyone feels they've benefited in the success of the economy in recent years and that in promoting long-term success in the UK, the Prime Minister is saying we need to promote long-term success and to make sure it benefits all employees in business. So I think that promoting of long-term success, very welcome in the new code. Also, promoting entrepreneurial management. And entrepreneurial management is really about being innovative, looking forward to the future, and balancing that with effective risk management. So that promotion of long-term success in the code, I think, is something for all boards to be very conscious of as they seek to implement the code. And it's easy sometimes to go for quick fixes that will give short-term results. I think it's much harder to go for an approach that promotes long-term success, but much more valuable um, to all participants. Moving on to the four key areas that the, um, the new Bucharest uh, Stock Exchange Code covers. Firstly, the responsibilities of management and of the board, the board's role. Secondly, risk management. Thirdly, the rewards issue, which again, the president discussed. And fourthly, building value through investors' relations. And if we will look at briefly each of those now. The new code highlights the responsibilities of the board and the code sets out, your code sets out the principles and provisions. In looking at the general principles, the overarching key features, it covers well a number, a number of areas. If I can try and group some of the areas there, I think it covers how the board should operate in terms of regular, regular board meetings and secrecy of meetings. Um, and regular board meetings would be something that we'd also be stressing in the UK code. And much, actually, there's a great deal of similarity between the Bucharest code and the UK code. Um, regular board meetings, important that the board meets enough times during the year such that no major event happens between board meetings that doesn't get discussed by the board. And I think particularly conscious that a number of major companies listed on 
the Bucharest Stock Exchange or some of the major companies would be banks. Our financial regulator in the UK is particularly keen to make sure that bank boards meet sufficiently regularly so that they're keeping up to touch with all developments. The next area that there be a rigorous appointment for the process for the appointment of new board members. Um, very important to get the right people on the board, to get a balance of mix and personalities. And your code talks about the balance structure of, of board members. Also important, having got good people on the board in a balanced range, important that they do have enough time and that they're not on too many boards such that they don't have enough time. Again, one thing is often stressed is important that directors have enough time that if there's a crisis on one of their boards, they can give the time to help sort out the crisis. And it's not just that everything's going well, they've got enough time, that they do have enough time to cope with unexpected um, challenges. Following the, following the principles, the provisions then set out some of the detailed requirements that boards should follow. Um, so board of directors, supervisory board should have at least five members. There should be clear terms of reference. Um, and then talking about the importance of independent directors. At least one board member should be independent for standard tier companies and two for premier tier companies. Independence is an area that over the years we've stressed <coughs> more so in the United Kingdom as the years have gone on. So we now say that for our FTSE 350 companies, the largest listed companies, if you exclude the chairman, half the directors should be independent um, and that the chair should be independent when appointed. Um, and then, touching on the related party issue, the board members should disclose any relationship where they've got more than 5% of the shares and the company should have a policy on board evaluation. In the UK, the FTSE 350 companies, the largest listed companies, are called on to have an evaluation externally facilitated every, every, three, every three years. And I'll touch a little later on the merits of that. Um, and premier tier companies should have a nominations committee made up of non-executive directors with a majority being independent. So trying to make sure that those choosing the board members are independent of management, which is clearly an important um, principle. I mean, in some ways, getting a good board in place is straightforward. It's, it's about choosing the right people, but it's just choosing the right people is more complex in a board than in many other situations. With a board, you've in effect got a team within a team. You've got the executive team and then you've got the wider board team. So getting the executive team to be working well, to get the whole board working well, and to get the executive to be working well with the board really does need careful looking at the personalities. It's also about making sure that the key, the key relationships work well, chairman, CEO, audit committee chair, finance director, etc. So there's lots of relationship management that needs to go on if the board is to work, work well. And I think really to stress the importance of boards giving enough time to checking that they are working well as a team, easily forgotten, and certainly, you know, many boards are less than comfortable spending much time on asking how well was we working as a team. But if the board is working well as a team, it'll be much more effective because you can challenge the difficult issues and talk about them openly and honestly. Whereas if you're not really working well as a team, it's much harder to do, to do that. Moving on to risk management. The risk management internal control, it, it asks really three, three key areas. That board should have an efficient risk management system. It should have a good internal audit function and that it should have an effective audit committee. So three key areas to get right, all interlocking with each other. And also then, linked to my earlier discussion, absolutely vital, the related party transactions should be considered you know, in a fair and open manner um, and properly, properly approved in order to ensure that all shareholders are treated fairly and equally. But if you've got the first three in place, that's likely to happen. On the audit committee side, the, the stress is that you should have an audit committee, one independent member, and from pre premium tier companies, there should be at least three members with a majority being independent. In the UK, 
for a number of years now, we've called on all members of the audit committee to be independent. Um, we're similar in the sense that the majority of members sh well, should have relevant qualifications. We call on at least one member to have relevant accounting and auditing um, qualifications. And often you find, uh, certainly in the UK, that the chair is the one with relevant auditing and accounting qualifications. It's very hard if you're not the chair to have access to all the information. So if you are the one with the accounting and audit qualifications, you normally will want to be, be the chair to ensure you've got access um, to the information. But the other thing to stress on audit committees is they're not just for the accountants. The audit committee should have people who've got good business skills as well as the necessary auditing and accounting skills. And they called on, the audit committee called on to undertake an annual assessment of internal um, control. And so I was really just highlighting there, I think the risks for audit committees is that you get too busy, that audit committees often, when you're not sure which committee to allocate something to, it's often given to the audit committee. So I think it's very important for the audit committee to make sure that you're using your time well. And sometimes it is to say we need more time, that we need to add on an extra meeting. So I think important to do that. Important also on the audit committee to make sure that you have enough time, for example, to look at the accounts um, before the board meeting of which they're going to. So important that you get the order of the meetings right and the, the amount of time at the meetings also, also right. Then looking at the issues relating to internal audit and the assessment of internal audit, um, an internal audit very important. Internal audit difficult to be head of internal audit because the audit committee wants you to offer an independent view. You're, you're working within the company. There should be, again, we call for, in the UK, we, we expect the head of internal audit, their primary reporting role to be to the audit committee chair, but we accept that there'll also be some reporting to the chief executive. But important for the head of internal audit to be respected by both management and the board as being understanding the business and not just checking things, that they do really understand the business and offer good value business advice. But also important for both sides to accept, and I say both sides, hopefully the board and management should be working together. But sometimes in difficult times, the, audit, the head of internal audit will sometimes have to raise difficult issues. And then it's important that the board feels they are willing to be independent and are willing to tell difficult truths um, you know, wh when they need to be told. So in some ways, the head of internal audit in the difficult times can be a lonely job, but a very important job. And so very important for the audit committee to recognize the importance of that role. The next area to touch on is the looking at conflicts of interest. And as I said, clearly very important where there is a major um, shareholder that those conflicts you know, are looked at openly and the undue preference isn't given to any party. And I think what the Bucharest Code covers very well is both the making sure you've identified the issues, making sure you, they have been nobody has been treated unfairly, that there is fair treatment, but also making sure there's proper due process and that there's proper board approval for any, any related party transactions. Interestingly enough, and I think, as I say, it reflects our different um, structure of our listed companies, related party transactions features less in our code, although it's clearly there under international financial reporting standards, than I think it does in, in the new Bucharest Code. And I think that reflects the importance that it has to companies listed on the Romanian stock exchange, on the Bucharest Stock Exchange. The next area to cover is the very sensitive area of director's remuneration. Um, and I think the, and again, your president touched of, of the exchange touched on that earlier. The code, the new code says the level of remuneration should be sufficient to attract, retain, and motivate skillful and experienced people. Um, I mean, there, 
the general discussion around this centers on it should be sufficient to attract, retain, and motivate, but not excessive in, in doing so. And it's how one gets that balance. Also, a very interesting issue as to to what extent you really look at remuneration within the country, or to what extent you say, well, I've got to recruit my senior executives from internationally, and so I need international um, pay scales. That's been quite a discussion in the UK where some would suggest that sometimes too much emphasis is given to American pay scales in some benchmarking and not enough to, to, other, to other countries. In a sense, the American pay scales tend to be much higher and those in continental Europe lower than America. And so depending on which countries you look at for international benchmarking will affect the result. So very sensitive in working out how to work out what's the right remuneration. Equally important to make sure that the information, that there's proper sharing of the information of how the remuneration has been calculated and that that's now and that that's available and transparency in remuneration reports. Again, this has been, this is probably the key issue on which the, our Prime Minister in Britain is focusing on in saying to business, you have got to change the way you're doing things. The feeling that the remuneration of senior executives has probably, um, the worry is that it's got very much out of line in the UK with that of other employees and that the inequality has grown significantly with other employees. So interesting issues you know, to look at is what is fair remuneration, not just in absolute terms, but what is fair remuneration relative to other employees? And if director's remuneration has increased quite significantly, is it fair if other employees' remuneration hasn't increased? So that's a very big political issue for business, certainly in the UK at the moment. And in looking at the provisions that are in the Bucharest Code on remuneration, so publishing the remuneration policy and stating how it's been, been applied, enabling stakeholders to understand the principles and rationale, and discussing the decision-making process for granting the remuneration, and recognising that it'll normally consist of salaries, bonus, long-term stock incentives, benefits in kind, pensions and other elements. Another key area that got introduced in the UK code some years ago was that when directors leave, um, particularly if there's been failure in the business, there shouldn't be over-generous leaving packages. Um, that's less controversial at the moment, but that was, some years ago, a very, a very big, big issue. The investors spend a lot of time looking at remuneration, clearly because they feel that remuneration drives drives behaviour. Um, and so, and it sometimes it's felt, and sometimes in London we have dinners at the firm with investors, some of the major institutional investors, and there is often a feeling that they're spending too much time in remuneration, but they can't get away from it because they, they keep getting worried about it. So some feeling that investors need, should be spending more time in areas like the audit committee, um, but it's very hard to because remuneration is still very politically politically sensitive. So I think being conscious of remuneration and the importance that investors at attach to it. I think also being very conscious that remuneration isn't, um, there's not a linear relationship between remuneration and performance, that more, you know, continually more remuneration doesn't necessarily mean continually higher motivation. And that other things, there's, you know, some discussion that other Part, you know, job satisfaction doesn't just come from remuneration, it comes from the values of the business and am I comfortable in, in, in the business. And so moving on to building value through investors' relations. Invest, I mean, basically, <clears throat> as, as has already been discussed, working effectively with the investors is absolutely, is absolutely vital. And I think both through the information you routinely publish and through the special meetings you hold with investors and through making that information available to all investors on your website promptly, etc. So I think working, it's very easy, I think particularly for smaller listed companies, 
I sit on the executive of the Quota Companies Alliance in London, which represents smaller listed companies um, in, in the UK. And one thing we find is smaller listed companies, the risk always is, if you're the direct finance director or the chief executive, you feel you're too busy running the business to spend much time with investors, but it's very important if you want a good view of the business, if you want to get your stock market price properly valued, it's very important that the investors understand not just how you're doing, but what your goals are, how you're trying to drive your business. What we call having a narrative on where you're trying to take your business is very important if you're going to get a good following among the investors. And in addition to the, to the principles, the new code sets out some very helpful guides on what should be included um, on, you know, on the website to help ensure investors have good information. So CVs of members of the governing bodies. And I think importantly to make sure those CVs are lively and actually do include relevant business experience, not just necessarily current business experience, but you know, some other business experience and business experience you know, that the director may have with other companies as well as, as, well as with your own. Um, in terms of filing information, some discussion at the moment on should there be quarterly reports, some feeling the quarterly reports stops focusing on long-term success and makes too much focus on short-term success. But as well as the actual annual reports, the statutory information, as one might say, important that corporate presentations are on, are on the website. And details of the cash distribution um, and the dividend policy. Um, and that's been a controversial issue in the UK with, uh, I sit on the regulated Financial Reporting Council. We've got a financial reporting lab, which is an innovative part of the regulator, which looks at voluntary disclosures. And we've recently come out with a requirement or with an expectation, suggested, not a requirement, to companies that they should disclose their, their dividend policy. And also policy on forecasts, important to, to disclose. So just in the last section, just looking at a few ideas on how to improve effectiveness and board, board evaluations, as, as I said, just looking here at board evaluations where in the UK, the companies are expected, the largest companies, listed companies, are expected to have an externally facilitated board evaluation. Um, you can do a very thorough internal board evaluation. I think the benefit of an external board evaluation periodically is that it allows you to get an outside view. And just sometimes I've found when doing, as I look after our board practice in the UK, I've just found sometimes when doing it that an issue that all the directors know is there, most of these sort of metaphors don't translate entirely. We call it the elephant in the room. Um, in English, sometimes there'll be an elephant in the room that everyone knows about, but nobody's speaking about. And sometimes having an outsider in can just make sure that that issue that's stopping the board being wholly effective um, gets, gets, dis gets discussed. Um, in looking at board evaluations, many companies are expected to report in the UK on how they've done the evaluation, but many also report on some of the results. The results that you often find coming out from the evaluations when they're externally done is board wanting to spend more time on strategic issues. Boards always worry that they spend all their time on day-to-day -day issues and not enough time on the longer-term strategic issues. Um, another issue comes out very regularly is boards wanting to spend more time on succession planning. Particularly, I mean, clearly succession planning is how should I replace a board member if they you know, suddenly taken ill. But equally, the long term, making sure that if I've got a good board in place, that I keep it in place. Every so often you see a good board in place, but you can just see too many directors are going to retire at the same time, and that it'll be hard to keep a good board. So making sure you have thoughts of how you're going to make sure future directors are appointed. And particularly picking on the earlier discussion um, uh, of Ariella, the, um, the issue of diversity is very important. Um, UK boards, there's been a lot of pressure to increase the female representation on boards, and it's now at about 25% for FTSE 100 companies. But in addition to increasing female representation, also a feeling that ethnic minorities, different ethnic minorities should be properly represented on boards. 
but most importantly in a way that as well as those visible characteristics and fairness characteristics of am I allowing everyone a fair chance to be on the board, actually making sure that diversity of thought is in the board, that whoever you've got on the board, that there is somebody who'll challenge, you know, challenge some of the decisions to make sure they're properly considered. So succession planning an important issue for boards. Um, and the one that'll upset any company secretary here today, improving the quality and the timeliness of agenda papers. Often there'll be a feeling that agendas come out a little bit too close to the meeting. And particularly in areas like banks again, where there's an enormous lot, amount of information to look at that you do need, say, to have it at least a week um, before, before the meeting. And that good quality MI is absolutely critical. So there's some of the issues coming out in board evaluations. Just two other areas. One is on board culture and a feeling that actually there should be, boards should be taking more account of board culture board culture, how the board works, um, and sorry, corporate culture, but board culture and corporate culture, how does the company work? Does the board know how the company really works? You know, the board will set out, these are our values, and I mean, Enron had set out some really great values, but, you know, they weren't being implemented. So a real challenge for board is, and again, our financial services regulator is placing particular emphasis on this. If you're on a bank board or an insurance company board, you know what your values are. How do you know that lower down the organization, those values are being followed? And what is corporate culture? You know, sometimes described as how people behave in the business when nobody's looking. So I guess, you know, we've had the recent case in the US of a major bank where, you know, there were lots of accounts being opened in customers' names without the customers approving it in order to hit targets. So, you know, the board should know how, how things are actually working. I think the other issue for the board is for the board to be very aware of is it remuneration policy leading to risks? If you've got a very aggressive remuneration policy that really gives high awards, very high awards to incrementally good performance, are you encouraging people to do things that you know, might be better that they didn't do? So you know, being careful on the corporate culture is how the business runs how you think it runs as the board. And how you can do that is through employee surveys, through talking to employees when they're leaving the business, um, through just the board members, the non-executive directors, not just talking to executive directors, but knowing members of the staff at different levels, just walking around the, the business. And again, that just highlights the importance of what we call the softer process, as well as having the right structures, that the informal processes that the non-executives have a good idea of what's going on, but also the informal process in terms of the board working well, that the non-execs and the executives meet outside of meetings. They talk to each other sometimes as people, not just as business people, in order that they can work well together. And if you build the relationships on a board in the good times, it's really there and a real, real value to you when you come up with challenging times. So spending time as a board on the informal relationships, on building good relationships among board members is also, is also absolutely vital. And my last area is just on corporate reporting, um, which I guess you could say is the shop window of the company, but making sure that it's fair, balanced and understandable is very important. You know, does your annual report talk about the challenges you've had. By all means, talk about how you've tried to address the challenges and work with them. But it, if it just contains the good news, people don't tend um, to, to believe it very much. I mean, often you find, I think particularly with, um, you know, reports on, from travel agents, you know, on how to visit a particular resort or go to a particular hotel. If they only give you the good news, it doesn't really impress you. Um, so you tend to want to hear a balanced, a balanced view of a business. So does the annual report give a balanced view? Also, does it talk about the important issues? It is the financial statements, but not only the financial statements. Narrative reporting is much, much more important now. Many more businesses, their values are in their people or in their intangible assets, and they're often not in the financial statements. So does the narrative reporting contain a good view of what's important in the business. And also, is the audit committee looking at the annual report to check how it can be improved, to check what other companies are doing 
to make sure they are following industry best practice as well as the regulatory requirements. And so just to my final slide, I think, if I've got it, um, if it's right, we seem to be a couple behind there. Yeah, the, the final slide, really just to come back to an earlier comment, at its heart, running a board is very simple. It's getting the right people on the board and then making sure the board works effectively. But the real challenge is that people are involved and we all have our feelings and our ways of doing things and different experiences. So it really is, if you're gonna have the right board in place and working well, it really needs constant working at and constant asking the question, how can we get better? But it really is worth the effort because the tone from the top is really vital to the business and the tone from the top seeps all the way down to everything else the business does. So really, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this morning and good luck as you continue to implement the code and to building internationally world-class boards in Romania. Thanks very much.